the interviewee. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, you can. I mean, I because I'll ramble sometimes. <laughs> uh, makes three of us. Then there's uh, there's no particular um, set direction we're going with this. We just tend to like our conversations to to flow freely. So um, okay, yeah. I think uh, Patrick's already started recordings. So. Right. Recording. I'm trying to trap you guys to say stuff you shouldn't say. But, uh, <laughs> it's no good, Pat. I've uh, noticed the little, the little thing along across the top of the screen here that says recording has started. So, uh. yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, guys, yeah. oh, let me introduce sure. uh, Lawrence Leppard for for you guys who who don't know him. As uh, as soon as me and Kevin we started the, this uh, new podcast channel, uh, I I knew Lawrence. We had to uh, have a talk with him because. Um, all the charts that we see, the macros, the fundamentals, Lawrence has been looking at them for way longer than than I have for, for and maybe Kevin, and uh, he could definitely li- shine some light to see how uh, everything like matches up together there. So th- thank you, uh, yeah, Lawrence. Oh, for- thanks, you guys, for having me on. It's always a pleasure to be with you, and I think you guys do great work. I mean, I, I'm not really a chart guy. I'm, I'm more of a kind of a macro fundamentals guy, but I but I do look at the charts because they, I, I think they inform us a lot about, you know, critical levels and so on and so forth. I mean, it, um, there's, there's a lot of information in the charts and it's, it can't be messed with. So I like that. Well, yeah, right before, like I hit the record there, you, uh, like you're wondering when is this thing gonna <laughs> move ahead? Well, yeah, that's maybe- what we all wonder, right? Yeah. Man, well, that's when TA has to show up or or put right. up, right? Yeah, no, I mean, that's why I asked you guys. You're the experts. I look. I know fundamentally it should have moved ahead years ago, but that you know, <laughs> we know that suppression and and you know manipulation has has held us back. But um, I'd be curious to your opinion. My opinion is it'll happen in the next six months, and perhaps a lot sooner than that. So uh, yeah, oh well, look at that. That's that tells you something right there. Sure. <laughs> well, this is this is a chart for Bitcoin. So, um, you oh. know, if you're looking, if you're looking at if you're looking at cryptocurrencies, that's that's the one to look at. But if you're looking at um, where do you want to start? Do you want to start with precious metals? Do you want to start with um, the Let's US start dollar? With, start with PMs. I mean, I'm a I'm 80% PMs and 85% PMs, 15% Bitcoin. But okay, well, you know, they are. I do think they they are somewhat more than somewhat. They are linked in the sense that they both represent private money alternatives to fiat, which in my view, as I think everybody who's listened to me knows, I, I strongly believe is in the process of failing. Um, but it, it's it's taking its time. I mean, well, uh, yeah, things 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 do take a little time to to pan out, don't they? I mean, you right. can see gold gold here going back. Uh, well, on this particular wow. chart going back to the 1990s, and you can see how we had a very strong sort of uptrend through the early 2000s. And yeah. really, what's been going on since then is just a a consolidation really when you zoom right. out and look at it on a, on a bigger scale it i mean it, up to two thousand right. dollars down to 1050 back to 2000 and we're now building a something of a consolidation here if i move this label out the way here you can see that this downtrend since last august is really just a, a consolidation period that's building for a, a bigger picture move so um yeah, yeah what, what are your thoughts on uh on, on gold and well I mean, first of all that's that's a beautiful chart i mean uh, to me and then uh, i guess uh you know mcgee and edwards you know, technical guy would say that's one large cup with a handle and maybe within it, I mean, there's, there's a cup, big cup there, but then uh, there's another, there's kind of a smaller cup and a handle on the right hand side of that. But um, yeah, I mean, it tracks, my thinking is that, you know, the, and I see this in you know, people I talk to in Toronto and a lot of other areas. I mean, I, my thinking is that a lot of people are saying, okay, well, yeah, you got a nice spike up into the 2000 area. But, it, you know, it got ahead of itself. It was all COVID driven and, you know, we're going to get COVID under control and the inflation is transitory. And, you know, some people look at this and they say, oh, there's a double top here. You know, you had a top in 2011. You got a top now. Mm-hmm. You know, we're going down. And um, I still see companies and, and banks in Toronto, which is kind of the headquarters for a lot of the mining finance, um, you know, modeling four years of average gold prices and saying, all right, we've got to run these things at 1700 or 1650 or whatever it might be. Uh, and, and, you know, nobody's saying, hang on a sec, you know, we're going to we're going to go through 1900 again and then we're going to be in clear air, as you say. And, you know, I, I take, you know, any way you want to look at it or measure it, any technical work would suggest to you that it's not going to stop at 2075 or 2100 or 2200. It could go could easily run, I would think, to 23 and, and possibly to 3000 within a year. So, 
And, you know, in what I do, which is pick the stocks, you know, I, my fund has some metal in it, but very small amount. You know, the general business of my fund is to pick the best mining stocks. Um, you know, that if those kinds of numbers would have a profound effect upon all these stock prices because the funds in my, you know, the, the companies in my fund are doing just fine at 18 or 1900. I mean, they're showing record profits, record cash flow. You know, they can develop new mines. I mean, it's, it's all good at today's price. And as you know, the fixed costs don't respond as quickly to the higher prices. I mean, they will respond because input costs will go up, but not nearly with the speed at which the price of gold could go up. So that if we go to 1900, which I think we will soon, and then we take 2000, 2100, I think what's going to happen is you're going to see, you know, really rapid acceleration in the earnings of a lot of these companies. And so, you know, that's a powerful combination when you have a public, you know, company that's trading at a four times cash flow or 25%, you know, cash flow yield, and then cash flow is going to grow 30 to hundred percent, you know, so you've got underlying cash flow growth that's outstanding based on the metal price being higher. And you've got, you know, a chance for a re-rating, which is should these things be trading at four times cash flow when in a zero interest rate environment. And of course, you know, my answer is no, they shouldn't. They should be trading much higher. It's the only, it's really other than maybe the fangs, it's really the only highly profitable segment of the market. Um, you know, you're going to get multiple expansion as well. So, you know, I think we're looking at, you know, two, three, four baggers in a lot of mining stocks as these metals prices take out that that upper ceiling that we're bumping up against here. I have two questions, uh, Larry. Yeah. How do these miners come up with these these prices for gold that they they think that gold okay we have to have our we think gold's going to be at 1600 for the next years uh, and we're basing all our operating costs based on that or where do they get that number from is it just an average from the past yeah years? I mean, some of them the different formulas that are used I mean look it's a cyclical industry and it's a commodity and you know a lot of the people who are in it are are kind of you know, linear thinking engineering types who are trained to, to find deposits and break rocks. I mean, they're not macroeconomists and they're not, they're not chart people. So not to say that some of them don't get it, but a, a lot of them don't. And they've seen a lot of commodity cycles come and go. And that, so they tend to know, and this is why in the last cycle, you saw a lot of people hedging. They, they tend to, they look at something and say, well, that was really nice that we hit 20 th or 2070 last summer, but it won't last. And they're, you know, let, let's not get ahead of ourselves because there's some, there've been so many times in prior cycles where they have gotten ahead of themselves. They've taken on debt, they've done stupid acquisitions and it's come back and bit them in the ass. And, you know, and it could this time too, by the way, I mean, there's no, there's no law that says gold has to go higher. I mean, I think the, you know, I think the macro backdrop that we've got, you know, strongly implies that gold is going to go much higher, but it's, you know, there's no certainty in life. Yeah. Um, I mean, you you can right. study these. You can study these cycles going back all the way to the 1970s, and there's clearly a very cyclical behaviour to gold. And when you look at right. the eight, the eight-year election cycle, or well, actually it's the four-year election, uh, four-year election cycle, of course. But every eight years, um, at, at points number one, three, five, seven, nine, eleven, there's right. a, a notable dip in the um, in the in the uh, in the price of gold at each of these um, odd numbers. And of course, point number thirteen coinciding with an eight-year cycle low and uh, the U.S. election, of course, in uh, November 2024. So sometime in, in that time period, late 2023 to late 2024, is when the charts are sort of telling telling us or telling me that there's going to be something of a dip. But the main question for me is just how high we, we go before right. that. Right, from what level? I mean, I, yeah, I, I don't, you know, yeah. yeah, I mean, the one thing is for sure, it tends to, you know, it's a wild beast, right? I mean, it tends to run really hard really fast and and then and then attempts to correct in the same in the same manner and so it, w it would not surprise me i mean and 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 by the way i mean if we say we go through the 2070 you know we've now got kind of a triple a double top breakout and so how far is it going to run i have no idea but it wouldn't be unusual to see it run to 25 or 3 or you know i mean maybe much higher but then it wouldn't be unusual also to to see it correct you know, and come back and retest the breakout level of the 2100. So, um, and that's the nature of these things. But again, we just we just really don't know. I mean, at some point, I think there is a chance that that the corrections will end. I mean, if you 
kind of look, I mean, I don't think this one will be the one that, that ends it, but I think at some point there'll be a Gresham's law kind of effect going on where um, everyone, you know, if you kind of look at the charts of what gold did in Weimar or in any sort of a hyperinflationary environment, I think both of those are possibilities, not yet, but in the future, um, you know, there, there could be, there could be a time when we break out and we don't look back. Well, you have to. You only have to look back to the 1970s to see gold going from uh, around about $100 to around about uh, $800 exactly. plus. So and it, those, it, correct, it corrected off of that, but it sure didn't correct all the way back to its base, right? No, I mean exactly. that that was an eightfold yeah. increase. So if we were to see an right. eightfold increase from uh, the starting point, that would take us to $8,000, which might sound crazy, but um, you know it's, it's, it's happened. It's happened before and post. Exactly, post and, and and maybe and so maybe it corrects from eight to six or eight to five and. But I mean, I can assure you that, you know, everybody who's invested in the sector in, in any kind of numbers that look like that, you know, is going to be feeling really good about life. And even coming back to five isn't going to destroy them. I mean, the, you know, the other person in this area who I think has done a very good job at it historically, as well as you guys, what you're doing here, which is good work, is is Michael Oliver. And I just listened to a, a video of him from last week where, you know, he said, look, it's, you know, these numbers sound crazy high. But they're not unprecedented. I mean, we could easily see five to ten thousand dollar gold. I mean, it's it's totally within the realm. And and here's what excites me. I mean, I you know, again with with these little companies that I'm in, um, you know, the the, the amount of money these guys are going to make at three thousand dollar gold is just going to be stunning. And um, and three thousand is not that far away. I mean, that's a thirty three percent run, you know, from kind of where we are. Maybe a tad more now, thirty three percent from two. So, you know, it's, there's a, there's a lot of optionality here on the upside and I do feel like it's coming, but, but again, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I mean, it might be, you know, it could be a year from now. It's not, you know, the, the, the one thing about these, these bull markets is they, they do tend to shake everybody off, at, you know, and they, you know, there's nothing, nothing's free in life. I mean, all the people who joined last August because it was ripping, you know, are now kind of thinking to themselves, geez, did I do the right thing? And some of them probably sold out and, and given up. I, mean, I know, you know, Warren Buffett bought a bunch of Barrick and announced it back, you know, in the last summer time frame, and, and they're out of it now. So, you know, um, it has a way of kind of throwing off people who don't believe. But I, you know, I believe, and I think the, I think the, I think the macro conditions strongly favor much higher prices in this in this segment. I mean. So Talk, yeah. Talking about the macro conditions, um, I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to pull up a chart here, which I, I I think I've shown just about every guest that we've had on our uh, yeah uh, on our right. podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. This is the Treasury yields, and um, it's this is the catch twenty two chart as far as I'm it concerned. Really when, I, when, I first, catch, when I first right? when I first drew this, it kind of blew my mind a little bit because yeah. I don't see i mean the the numbers in the blue boxes um lawrence are the uh, are the um stated right. us government debt without right. without the un, without the unfunded liabilities and it's taken 7 years to go from 20 trillion to 23 trillion um and then you know to go to go from uh, sorry not from uh, 20, <laughs> get my maths right here so to go to 23 trillion from around about um 14 trillion Took about seven years, roughly speaking, seven or eight years, something like that. Mm. So to add to add seven trillion to the national debt, in other words, but yeah. we've added seven trillion to the national debt in the last uh, eighteen months or so. So all that time right. that's added to that debt, we've done it in. Right. in no, space it's, of months. yeah, it's it's the nature of these credit bubbles. They need to accelerate. They need to grow, or they die. And um, you know, they it's you know Richard Russell, the old newsletter race you know he coined the phrase inflate or die and um so, yeah and so what's, so what, what, what's the what's the answer here because if um right so the, the way i'm the way i read this chart is that if inflation starts to creep up and <laughs> the fed tries to raise interest rates they're going to have an issue because the debt isn't what it was back here 15 yeah, like, trillion like 20 trillion the debt is now the debt's now north of 30 trillion so to raise the interest rates to the sort of levels that caused problems back here, which was um, what was it, about two right. and a half percent or three percent, you know, we, we can't even raise rates to that level now because clearly the rates were shoved down, pushed down, um, and um, uh, to, to to try and make us presumably to make the U.S. U.S. debt obligations um, um, payable effectively because right. you know if if rates are allowed to rise significantly beyond that 
then suddenly the, the mathematics doesn't work because the interest yeah. paid on yes. the and, that, that, that's, and that's why pardon me really Kev, the, those are the real yields right <laughs> yeah that's right yeah but okay. i can you know easily show the uh, the actual yields as well this is the yeah. 10, 10 year note here and it's, it's much the same sort of thing as soon as the 10 year um note tried to break out it was pushed pushed back down and um we've got this we've got this sort of conundrum haven't we this this kind of issue where if if um interest rates rise much then the debt on that previous chart i was just well, showing they can, you the yeah, they, they can never let interest rates go you know become a free market and go back to where they were and so i mean I, you know in my opinion their only hope is they're, they're going to play for time you know lie about inflation as much as they can keep the you know the bond yields negative real bond yields negative you know, and hope that they get nominal growth in, you know, on a nominal basis in GDP. I mean, this is the whole R squared argument that they make that, you know, as long as, as long as GDP is growing faster than the interest rate, they'll, they'll, they will eventually reduce the debt relative to the size of the economy. So instead of 130% of the GDP, you know, I mean, I think the target, you know, um, one analyst used was to get it down to 70% of the GDP. So that they actually have the ability to raise interest rates again, but yeah, the, the Paul Volcker raise interest rate solution that that's long gone. I mean, that just, that just doesn't exist anymore. So to me, you know, I, I mean, they say they have these tools. I always laugh. I, I watched and Jay Paul's going to be speaking today. I, I was watching him talking about these tools. I wish some of these Congress people would, would ask, you know, please tell us what these tools are that you have. I mean, other than talking about or lying about the rate of inflation or saying it's transitory or raising rates or reducing QE. Um, I, I don't see any other tools they have and the tools, those two tools of raising rates or, or reducing QE, you know, we, we've seen what happens when you try and do that because we, we had the fall of 2018 where the market fell apart and, you know, they became incredible doves very, very quickly. So, you know, it to me, they're trapped. And I've said this and I think most people, you know, many, many people realize this. Um, the entire investment market does not realize this yet, you know, and they don't fully understand the implications of this, but I think they will come to realize it as time goes by now, you know, it, the, the question to me that's uncertain is, is how they respond fiscally and, and policy wise. I mean, I think we're kind of in a crack up boom. And my sense is, you know, based on Stephanie Kelton, MMT, Biden, et cetera, my sense is, you know, if they can, if the, if the Republicans can't stop them, you know, they're going to keep, keep the accelerator to the floor on stimulus. And it's just going to be one pro, you know, infrastructure, you name it. You know, they're, they're just going to do one program after another to try and keep things going because they know the alternative is, is a depression and the, the economy blowing up. I mean, this is why I think they will eventually pass a law that says they can buy stocks. I mean, they'll call it, you know, the Save America's IRA plan. You know, we, we need we need the federal government needs the ability to buy the stock market. We can't have a stock market going down and everyone will cheer and say, oh, that's really great. But eventually, you know, what's going to happen? I mean, the federal government's like the naked emperor and all the little kids are going to go, hey, the guy's got no clothes on. And so, you know, eventually what's going to happen is the bond market, you know, gold investors and, and eventually even other investors are going to say, damn, this just isn't working. I'm out of here. You know, I want something that can't be printed. But right now, you know, they're saying, hey, you know, Google can't be printed. Or, I mean, they can issue more shares, but Google can't necessarily be printed. And hey, they beat the profit projections by 40% and it's a shiny object and gosh, I'm going to go chase Google, you know, and, and, and that's nice. I mean, I recall that in, in very inflationary environments like, you know, Zimbabwe, Venezuela, Weimar, et cetera, the stock markets did pretty well, you know, because there was a lot of money flowing around and some of it flows into a stock and a stock does represent a claim on a business and an earnings stream, which in the new economy or the new, you know, I mean, if, if what you're, if what we're careening towards here is currency failure, and that's what I believe is occurring. I mean, when gold gets to 10,000, in my view, you know, the dollar will have failed. You know, it'll just it'll just be a matter, a short matter of time before everybody says, you know, I, I don't want to get paid in dollars. I'm going to get paid in silver and gold. Um, and so, you know, as we're as we're heading toward that point, um, you know, our stuff will get better and better. And uh, yeah, that's a very interesting chart. I mean, I, you know, uh, take a look at that and, you know. When that when that eighty eight twenty five gets taken out, it's like look out, right? I mean, it's uh, <laughs> it's gonna be it's gonna be very interesting. The way I, I see the U.S. dollar, it's like a weapon, 
And yeah. if I if I own the U.S. dollar, I do the same thing. As soon as it goes up, uh, if I'd be the government, I dilute it every time. To, to always, and that's what they've been doing since 1971. If you look at yep. the U.S. dollar index, it's always lower highs, uh, especially inflation yep. adjusted. So why are they going to stop that pattern? Of course, yeah. the U.S. dollar are probably going to have rallies up, but those are going to get squished every single time until it's um, because th even if the Dow look goes up, if you divide it by gold, it hasn't done a, done a new high since I, I forget when. Oh, there. It's yeah, like no, no, no. It, since it, 2001, it, the U.S. equities have still have been losing since uh, when measured oh, in real. Yeah. Absolutely, no. It's look. I mean, it's amazing to me. Everyone's in, enamored with the stock market, but if you go look at the math, I mean, from 2000 to today. You know, gold, just the metal, not not gold stocks, just the gold metal has outperformed the U.S. S&P, um, which is, you know, but not many people know that or think about it or accept it. Um, everyone thinks, oh, the stock market's where you should put your savings and your wealth. I mean, you go to a brokerage firm and tell them you want to invest in gold, they think you're weird. You know, <laughs> but, you, you know, and they tell them you want to pay, you know, 100 times earnings for a, a growing tech stock with, you know, um, you know, with a lot of risk, and they're like, okay, yeah, that's great, you can do that. No for the earnings, uh, Larry, there, like you said, the price to earnings for I don't know much about like fundamentals, but for the stocks right now, they're super low. Is that what you're telling me? Like, the well, like, are, are we talking about gold stocks now? Yeah. yeah, gold stocks, yeah. So, yes, I mean, the gold stocks, um, I, I, we, um, maybe I can send it to you and you can append it to this video or whatever, but. Yes, I mean, if you look at uh, gold stocks compared to the underlying metal, they are at the very, very low end, end range. They're, they're silly cheap. They're silly cheap. I mean, the um, the metal has come up a fair amount, and the stocks have not fully participated to the degree that they should I think have. Patrick, Patrick might have that chart lurking around. Somewhere. Yeah, I mean, do, do a ratio chart <laughs> of um, do a ratio chart of GDX or Huey yeah. to uh, the gold contract, continuous gold contract. And you'll see what I'm talking about. I'm sure yeah. you can do that pretty easily. So um, okay, if I do that, then we're yeah, we're 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 low. You're right. We're far off those 2011 highs, like by any stretch. Right. If you got that, if you got that chart there, Patrick, I can uh, let you share the screen if you want to. Sure. Yeah. So, and, uh, so yes, I mean at a fundamental level, I mean look, there's I mean there's somebody in one of my reports. It was the report before this last one with my first quarter report. I had a chart that somebody had done. It was very nicely done. Where it showed the earnings power of these gold mining companies that are all they're some of the highest margin businesses in the in the world i mean some of them are earning 30 40 percent you know pre-tax margins and and yet they're trading at some of the lowest pe multiples in the world i mean as you know some of the high flying tech stuff trade at pe multiples that are you know 30 40 50 whatever um and in this particular case um you know i've got companies trading at five times earnings six times earnings Four times cash flow, you know. So, um, it's like, I, I there was a go, the next go big trade. Yeah. The, the, um, I had a, the next big trade on Twitter. There, he said, "Oh, for U.S. equities, they look the multi-bagger targets. Their market cap is in between." He told me, uh, twenty billion or five hundred million and twenty billion, and those are still high probability multi multi uh, baggers. But there's so less money in the gold sector that for us, we're looking at 20 to $100 million market caps right now as potential like multi-multi-baggers. Oh, absolutely. So it, it's yeah, take, crazy. Take that, take that, Patrick, on that chart. Take that out of log scale. If possible, sure. um, GDX is shorter. I mean, you might want to do dollar HUI yeah. because you'll, right. get more, you'll get a longer time frame on that. Um, to, yeah, exactly. Um, right, oh boy. Wow. right, yeah. right. So, you know, yeah, see, 0.6. So, this is a ratio of the stock index to the underlying metal. At the top of this chart, the stocks are expensive to the underlying metal. At the bottom of this chart, the stocks are cheap to the underlying metal. They've only been cheaper. Well, they, they were about the same in 2000, which kicked off an enormous bull market, right? And they were cheaper at the bottom in 2015, which kicked off that correction. And then, of course, they were cheaper on the, you know, the COVID panic in March of last year. But 
um, you know, as you can see, you know, with the top being kind of when the miners are fully valued compared to the metal, you know, where are we? We're, we're bouncing around near the bottom. You know, we're a little, we're off the bottom. We're not right at the bottom, but it's, you know, you can see, I mean, and, and what this shows you if, it, you know, so it's a, I think the ratio there is 0 0.4, 0 0.14, the ratio of the top is 0.6. Yeah. So, so without, without necessarily the profits of the miners changing, if we were to get multiple expansion, you could get a 400% growth in some of these shares just if they became more popular. Do you follow what I'm saying? I mean, that would obviously take them to the high end of the range and they'd be overvalued. But, you know, I mean, even if they just, I mean, 0.4 to 0.28, show, show on the line, show where 0.28 would be, you know, just below the 0.30, you know, you would, um, you would get, uh, you know, a doubling yeah. stock. Just if we went back to kind of the average, I think the average is like 0.35 or something. So, yeah, that's insane, there, Larry. What right? we've seen, the miners, even since 2004, they've been underperforming the uh, the metal. What's that about? Well, it's because people don't believe. They don't believe we're in a bull market. They, they, they never accepted uh, that gold was worth uh, 1900 or whatever it was back right. then. They never believed That's right. It. Well, and also, I mean, you've got to remember that the, you know, people invest in the rearview mirror, right? Why are people buying high overvalued tech stocks? Because they've really worked since 2009, you know, 10, 11 years, that's been the place to be. I mean, if you were in the triple Qs, if you were in the FANGs, I mean, you made a lot of money, right? So, okay, so people chase that, right? So if you bought gold stocks, you know, in 2011, from 2011 to 2015, you lost a lot of money. I, I know, I was there, it sucked, <laughs> okay, <laughs> right? We all remember that, okay? Yeah, we all remember that, and as a result, um, you know, people are skittish and they, you know, I like, I like that chart even better now, Pat. <laughs> that, that, that chart is, that's a brilliant chart. See, to me that, that you, you, you've perfectly encapsulated where we are in this, Spring up in this cycle. Right. And you know, the next, I mean, I, when, a, when a gold bull, when a gold stock bull market works, it can be a six to 10 X experience. And that's in the big names. I mean, I'm dealing in little names that have even more optionality. So, you know, I mean, I've, I've got a portfolio full of companies that if, if I can't double it or triple it in the next three years, you know, I ought to be shot. I mean, assuming, assuming I'm right about the, the price of the metal. I mean, if the metal doesn't go to 2,500, then, well, obviously I'm going to be wrong. But, but I, assume the, I assume macro conditions are going to make the metal go higher. And then with that, you know, the, the metal can go up 30%. The, the typical rule of thumb is the stocks leverage the percentage gain in the metal by three. So if the metal goes up 30%, you know, the stocks ought to go up 90%. And that sounds about right to me. Kevin, right. check this out, man. Sorry, like we're yeah. about, this chart is, is it's insane. Uh, right. Look for, I think we might be peaking later, later this year. So the miners, they should be bouncing soon versus the metal yeah. and maybe hit some resistance in 2022 later on, then a pullback and then we go crazy. But uh... I think that's exactly right. And and by the way, that's what's going on right now. If you listen to Michael Oliver, you look at some of the stuff and the miners are starting to demonstrate some relative strength. I mean, I, you know, I, I think some people are going to ask and be concerned. Everyone's, you know, frustrated and things taking forever. And I honestly think we've seen the bottom. I think we saw the bottom in March in the miners and the metal. And, you know, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm always an optimist, but I, I kind of believe that, you know, that Powell's probably going to say something dovish today and that, you know, we're going to, we're going to start to catch a bid and come roaring out of here. You know, in the well, that, all, all, all that happened in March there was <clears throat> same thing happened with a lot of the um, individual charts on the individual stocks in March. Well, yeah, I don't know. I mean, we had, look, we had a liquid... price came down and touched the edge of the arc, which was already in place. So it was literally right. just we, we had a liquidity crisis in March. I mean, you know, I know was I was getting margin called right and left. I mean, it was a disaster. But yeah. it, it it only just touched the edge of the arc there, right. which was just from a technical point of view, was just confirming right. the pattern right. that we already knew was there. Yeah, exactly. No, that's a yeah. that's a beautiful chart. That gives you a very good sense of, and it's interesting. I mean, you can see what happened back in two thousand eight. You know, the same same kind of thing. Right. Man, hold on, guys. I'm opening my brokerage account. I'm just loaded up on miners right now. <laughs> the thing, the thing, the thing to note is that on the when you're on the right hand side of one of these arc basing patterns, 
yeah. good things happen to the upside when yeah. you're on the left hand side and you're sort of jumping across the base of that arc which is exactly what happened here and you're trying to levitate above the middle of the arc you're yeah. always at the risk of a downside spike which is exactly what happened there and and put in a touch point on the edge of the arc. This might yeah. sound like kind of a foreign language to a lot of people, but all it, all it really is. No, and and, and, and look, if you, if you look at that really carefully, we could I could be wrong. I mean, we could be in for another th rough three or four months. I mean, it's very yeah. possible. We're not quite at the arc right now, right? So, I mean, it's, you know, look, as you as you guys know, this is not a, an exact and perfect science. But, no, it gives, but, it gives us a roadmap. It doesn't... Right. Uh, Right. Doesn't tell I mean, us every would, step. Doesn't tell us every step of the journey, but it shows exactly. you which uh, which route you need it's, to be on. It's a model that you can use to kind of begin to develop a thesis and an understanding. I mean, that's the other thing. Take a look at how sharp the upswing was there in 2016. I mean, that really broke people's hearts, right? I mean, okay, so we had this enormous downswing. Everybody got crushed. Then 2016 comes along. Wow. Okay, we're we're out of it. It's good, right? Well, no, maybe not. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. So now everyone's kind of like, yeah, I, you know, is this a bull market and gold in the miners? I'm not sure. I mean, to me, it's it is. It's clearly one, and it's obvious. Um, but and, and and that's the way you know bull markets climb a wall of worry, right? I mean, everyone's looking at it and going, I don't know. I mean, man, I, I can't tell you how many people have said to me, "Geez, the miners have been so bad for me. I just I lost so much money." I'm never touching that shit again, ever. Right? <laughs> and that is exactly what you need for a bull market. Isn't well, it? that's right. That's exactly <laughs> right. I mean, if you want contrary sentiment, that's it. You know? Well, so, bull markets don't start with high sentiment. They start with No. Low I mean, there'll be a time when everybody in this area will be feeling like geniuses have made a ton of money two or three years from now. And my belief, because I was there in 2011, I remember that time when we were all, you know, having made a lot of money coming out of 08. And, you know, my belief will be, be a time to be thinking about how to lighten up and how to diversify. And, you know, it won't be, you know, it'll be kind of a watch out sort of situation. Everyone think, oh, this is a no brainer. Look at how much money you make in these mining stocks because they've just made it. You know, I mean, very, very much the way, you know, I think some of these fangs and some of this, this like I saw that Goldman Sachs unprofitable tech company index has gone straight up. I mean, that's heartache waiting to happen. You know what I mean? I mean, it's you know the the sentiment will get the sentiment will get very bubbly in this area, and by the way, that's a clue to start thinking about how to exit the area. So, but you know, look, that's that'll be a high quality problem a little further down the road, and those of us who are in it right now will have made some serious money between now and then, and and then we'll have to make a decision about how much we want to leave on the table and how much we you know if we want to walk away with some of it. Amen. So if it bounces, it has to bounce here. Uh, you never know what it could hit that lower line, couldn't it? Well, yeah, I did that one really fast there, guys. So don't get <laughs> <me there. laughs> oh, change. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> but now you're doing whatever you know, the good guy does. You're 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 amending your lines to to support your case. <laughs> <laughs> what? That's my job to do that. I know it is. <laughs> Look, it's hey, you're speaking to a weather forecaster here, so uh... exactly. but, <laughs> but look, I mean, the, you know, the 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 fact the fact does hold that that um, these things are cheap on a fundamental basis. There does appear to be a big macro tailwind. I mean, I was speaking to an investor earlier this morning. He, he intelligently said, "What would what would get you concerned?" I'll tell you what would get me concerned. So the federal government says, "You know what? We're spending way too much money. We're going to cut back on defense spending. We're going to close all these bases." We're not going to be the policeman of the world anymore. We're going to means test Social Security. We're going to means test Medicaid. We're going to, um, you know, we're going to cut federal spending in every single way possible and try and get the United States back on a, on a healthy fiscal and, and monetary course. You know, that wouldn't be good for us. Um, but, you know, then think, think about that for a moment. Think about what's going on and think about what really are the odds of that happening. But, you know, and I would submit that they're pretty low. But but if that were to happen, that would not be good for our thesis. Um, yeah. You know, but having said that, I don't really see that happening. I don't see the odds of that happening as being very meaningful right now. I think I think in turn, you know, the economy is probably weaker than people think. Once all the stimulus wears out, they're going to need more. You know, yeah, OK, there's some inflation. I, uh, you know, look, I believe long term we've turned the corner on inflation and that we're back in an inflationary environment. But it's not going to be runaway because, um, you know, be, below the surface, the economy is kind of punk in, in a lot of ways. So, you know, there's, there's going to be, look, there are a lot of cross currents here. There's just a lot of cross currents. But 
But I do know this. I do know that the people in government, generally speaking, want to preserve their positions, their power, their jobs, everything else. They do that by keeping the system running. And the system needs more and more credit and more and more money to run on a continual basis. And that is a positive catalyst for gold because monetary debasement, negative real interest rates, those things drive you know, the substitute money, which has been around for 5,000 years and can't be printed. And people say, well, you might have deflation. I say, yeah, you know, we might have deflation, but guess what? If we have deflation, what's the best thing to hold? Cash, right? Because the price of everything goes down, you want cash to buy stuff. Well, gold is cash that can't be printed. So it's really great in deflation too, right? I mean, gold's very liquid. I mean, it's, you can't go to the store and buy shit with gold, but you can go to any coin dealer and sell your gold. I mean, there's a big market for gold. So, you know, to me, it's, it's really, it, it's, it's a win under both scenarios. If we have massive deflation, gold's gonna be fine relatively. And if we have massive inflation, gold's gonna be super fine. So, you know, I, I feel very, very comfortable sitting where we're sitting right now. And I think the next couple of years are gonna be pretty rewarding for us. And then, and then I think we're gonna have some tougher decisions to make because it won't be quite as, things won't be as cheap as they are right now. So. Well, the way, and also the way that I see it is that um, as the overall debt mountain increases, the interest rate that is in inverted commas affordable decreases. Yeah. So right. if 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 the, if the if the rate of interest that you can pay on that debt is slipping down and down and down, right. Then then the the background inflation required to create right. negative real rates. Um, decreases right. as well. So you don't, you don't need 10% inflation. Right. Exactly right. and, and the problem, 2% the problem, inflation would do it. Right. And the problem they've run up against is it's very hard to take interest rates negative. I mean, they managed to do it in Europe, but you, you know, you get down to kind of the zero bound of interest rates and then you got to start doing other stuff like sending money to people, which they've been doing. And guess what? Once you start doing something, you're going to have to do more of it. And so, you know, it, it's, you know, we can, I mean, I can see the end point. I, I don't know how quickly it's coming, but I can see the trend. I can see the end point. I mean, am I always watching for changes in the trend? Oh, sure. And, you know, is it possible they'll try and head fake us and bump the interest rates or with, you know, withdraw accommodation? Yeah, sure. I mean, they're trying to stay alive too. And they're very aware of the inflation risk and the hyperinflation risk and the Gresham's law risk and the currency risk. They know all that. They're not stupid. I mean, you know, this is a system they've set up that benefits them and they want to keep it going. And so we can't underestimate the, you know, the wiliness and the evil craftiness of the guys running the show. And, you know, but, you know, that to me, you know, they can't take away my gold. They can't take away my gold stocks. And I'm pretty sure they're going to be worth a lot more in real terms in five years. So, you know, I, I kind of sit back and I have to laugh at, you know, just how stupid the people running the show are. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, really, they're just, you know, I, I, I mean... And, and, and how, how venal they are. I mean, how much how they have to lie about, you know, all their, I mean, I mean, for Jake Powell to say, for example, that the Federal Reserve doesn't create wealth inequality. I mean, give me a break. I mean, you know, it's just, it's absurd. It's just, it's completely absurd, you know. Are they talking today? Is that what you said earlier? They're oh, yeah. A meeting? Oh, yeah. yeah, right. So there's a Fed meeting today and um, I believe they come out with at two o'clock. I don't think there's much expected from the announcement. I'm sure they'll just say policy's unchanged, blah, blah, blah. But more importantly, as you know, I mean, I'm not sure if there's a dot plot or not. I don't know the answer to that. Somebody told me there wasn't. But um, but he'll also have a press conference. And that will be important because, you know, just the way he looks, the things he says, you know, he'll he'll definitely lean in a direction, you know, about, you know, accommodation, interest rates, with you know, et cetera, et cetera. He, he will lean in one direction and the market will interpret that. And my belief is actually he's going to lean pretty dovish. Um, because I think below the surface, I actually think he's less concerned with inflation than he probably should be. But I also think below the surface, the economy is not as strong as it looks. I think the economy was held up by all the stimulus and all the, you know, the money they threw at it. And, you know, we haven't, they haven't signed the next thing. I mean, and by the way, any kind of an economic downturn will be the catalyst to cause the guys in Washington to go, oh, look at that. we got to come back at it. I mean, you guys, I don't know if you were here, how much you paid attention in 2008. I'll never forget when they put TARP up. Um, they said, you know, we got to do a $700 billion TARP plan to bail out these banks, blah, blah, blah. And Congress looked at them and said, what are you nuts? We're not doing that. No way. Well, the next day, the stock market was down big, right? And like two days later, TARP passed. Like, you know, they, they were like, oh, okay. Yeah, well, we get it. No, no, no. TARP's good. We're going to pass TARP. 
Yeah. So, and, and, and my sense is that'll be kind of what happens here. I mean, if they, if they dither around on the next round of stimulus and the infrastructure and all this other crap, the debt ceiling, you notice recently they've been talking about getting really hard on the debt ceiling. Of course, that's a joke because they've been saying that for the last 15 years. So of course they're going to pass a higher debt ceiling. That's a total no brainer. It's going to happen instantly. And they're going to say they, they really hammered it out and all oh, their cut spending and, you know, There'll be a bunch of noise around, but it's of course they're going to. They don't have a choice. They really don't have a choice. And that's that's what informs my investment decisions. The people who are running, the people who are running the system are holding a very bad hand, you know, and, and we've got them in check. And pretty soon it's going to be checkmate. And, you know, that's going to be kind of fun, actually, you know, because I, I really want to see these people fail badly. I mean, they deserve to fail and, I, and, I, and they will. I mean, they really will. So that's, that's going to be fun. They, uh, I always see it as you know, like kids, they'll always try to get away with it until they, they, they get caught. <laughs> exactly. And it's human nature. Yeah, no, that's right. And that's right. And the thing that kind of is, I'm sure you guys have the same reaction. The thing that's stunning to me is that more people haven't got on more quickly, but more and more people are catching up. I mean, I get more people just who have nothing to do with anything financial who are asking me, Oh, what about gold? What about inflation? What about, what about all this money praying? Wait, you know, I mean, it's, the awareness, I mean, I can assure you that five, 10 years ago, nobody had a clue and paid any attention to the subject, right? It's actually now kind of a, a thing. I mean, it's, I had it in my report, my quarterly report, which you can go to my website and get, um, you know, it's like Google searches on inflation. Well, you know, post all this activity, they've gone straight up. I mean, everyone's like, whoa, what's inflation? And you got to remember, a lot of people haven't lived through inflation. I was in my teens, but in the 70s, inflation was really kind of, it was pretty stunning. It was a big deal. I mean, I, I'll never forget my parents. I mean, you could buy a car, drive it for two years and sell it for more than you paid for it. Mm -hmm. so, you, so your used car was worth more, you know, than, than you paid for it. And the reason for that is because the new car had gone up even more. So, um, you know, and that's, that's inflation, right? That's what happens. So. Yeah, it was. I, I remember my parents telling me about that, that that period of time as well. And they bought their first house, and suddenly the mortgage repayments on the house went through literally through the roof. So you know they suddenly found that instead of paying twenty five percent of their salary to 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 meet the payments on their new house, they were paying sort of sixty seventy percent oh, of every penny that they brought in, and that was just paying the um, the, the mortgage repayments on the house. So oh, they must not have had a fixed rate mortgage. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, they, they had, go ahead. Uh, well, yeah, here in, I should say sorry, here in the okay. UK. Uh, fixed rate mortgages weren't really a, a, a popular yeah. thing back in the 90s. Ah, yeah, wow. So. Well, that, that had to be hard for a lot of people because, yeah, you lose your house. Yeah. 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 Well, that's happening in Canada. We don't have fix. It's crazy. The longer fix you could have, well, you have a 15 year or longer, but they, they, they charge two to three extra points on top of the whatever the rate is. Right, right. So yeah. here, everybody's on a variable, five year oh, variable. Or if right now, if you're smart, you lock in uh, five years, but that's it, five years. So in inflation, let's say that we go through a, a real, like they're starting to put the rates up uh, in yeah. five years, everything's going to crumble down because everybody, the prices oh, here have went skyrocketed for the houses. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that. Um, we're, we're trapped here in Canada. Yeah, that's that's not, that's not good at all in terms of higher interest rates. But yeah, I mean, it, look, it's going it, to, it's, it's not... It's, it's sad that we're in this state and it's sad that people are going to suffer as a result of it. But, um, you know, the, the, I'm an optimist and I do believe that on the other side of this, I mean, I, I think a lot more about my kids and my grandkids, you know, I don't have any yet, but <laughs> we'll have some at some point. Um, you know, I think a lot more about them and, and the system, the system's broken and the system's going to break completely and then the system's going to get fixed and that's really good. And so my view is a lot of people are like, well, let's try and keep this old broken system going. I mean, these are the people who are in power and making money off it. My view is, no, 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 let's just, let's get it over with. I mean, let's just rip this Band-Aid off, right? I mean, it's, it's a mess. You know, let's fix it. I mean, and there's actually a way they could do it with creating less pain, which would be a, a reset where they, they do what Roosevelt did. They reset the price of gold and they, they, they tie gold, uh, they tie the currencies to gold. And that would, that would stop inflation dead in its tracks. Now, it would be very hard for some people. But they would, it would solve the problem. And they're going to have to do that anyway. The difference is that they'll probably do it as a last, you know, that'll be the last thing they'll try. And it should be the first thing they try. Yeah, so, I mean, with, without that, though, any fiat currency just trends towards zero, doesn't it? Well, I that's mean, right. Just, I mean, it's no already around. Gone. Yeah. I mean, it's already gone a long way there. I mean, when you think about, you know, what a dollar will buy now versus what it would buy in 71. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. I, 
it's just it's, crazy. It's, it's, yeah, it's already the dollar's lost eighty some odd percent of its value just since seventy one. Higher? Yeah, I don't remember the exact number. It's huge, it's right? It's huge. It's huge. Yeah, I mean, in terms of real purchasing power. So, I mean, it's, it's the, you know, it's yeah. the design layer. It's 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 designed to be obsolete. When when you're not back with something yeah. and you could just get get away with it more and more, well, you just do. It's the, yeah. the beast. Well, and, and it and it benefits a specific set of people. It benefits. I mean, I. I Somebody coined the term, and I really like it, called cantillionaire. You know, cantillion was a guy back in the John Law days who um, got very wealthy by getting first access to the money. And the argument is that, you know, I mean, BlackRock's buying all these houses in the United States, and everyone says, well, it's a free market, let them buy them. Well, yeah, except that BlackRock's cost of capital is 30 basis points. You know, and so the people who have access to the free credit and the low cost capital can use that money to go buy up things in front of other people and drive up those prices. And then the poor young couple that's trying to buy a house to get started has to pay too much for their house because the contillionaires at BlackRock were able with the free money to front run them. And, you know, and that's why, I mean, this goes back to what I said about Jay Powell. And that's why it's so sad and unfortunate, you know, that he doesn't see or won't admit that, you know, this, this, this low cost money, this free money that the Fed injects into the financial system really benefits the financial players and lets them get rich at the expense of everyone else who doesn't have access to that money. And they, you know, they end up paying the price. And so, you know, the, the poor working slob, you know, pays a higher cost for his beer and his food, you know, and he doesn't get to buy his house with a 0% interest rate mortgage or a 30 basis point mortgage. And he's got to pay up for the house that BlackRock bought cheap, you know, and, that, and it's, it's just wrong. It's just, it's incredibly wrong. And so, you know, the pitchforks need to come out and I think they will. I mean, it's, you know, it, it ties in with this COVID thing. I mean, I, I thought it was fascinating what happened in France, you know, last couple of weeks in terms of these protests, you know, people are just, people are beginning to realize that the government really is not their friend. <laughs> you know, <laughs> And, you know, the, and if I were in government, I, I would want to be in government because I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's going to go real well for them in the next five years. I think they're going to have a very rough time. Ah. Uh. It's you know. it's it's our wives. They're going to start the revolution. My girlfriend said the the grocery bill costs four hundred dollars this week. Four hundred dollars. Well, that's right. That's, that's right. insane. I remember I, my I, parents I, saying a hundred bucks for a family of four in the eighties. Sure. What you you oh, were yeah. king. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I just got my health care renewal, and my health care year on year is up nineteen percent. But it's not free. <laughs> well, you're in Canada. <laughs> I know. I know. No, no. I mean, Bernie has not prevailed here. And you know, I used to be very opposed to socialized medicine, but when I see how broken the system is, um, you know, it's it's not. I don't know. Healthcare is a very tricky issue yeah. all the way around. And, and it's not free. I say it's free, but somebody pays somewhere. It's oh, nothing's absolutely. never free, right? But, but arguably, I mean, I you know, there are countries that have you know socialized healthcare solutions that provide much better economic outcomes in the United States. I mean, I, you know, uh, the, the United States healthcare system is really, really broken. I mean, it's, it's a disaster, you know, um, I mean, we're paying the U S pays twice, more than twice what the average first world country plays per capita in healthcare. And we actually get worse outcomes per capita. So, you know, somebody's making a lot of money there. And I, you know, I, I'm pretty sure I know who it is. It's not, it's not even the doctors. I think the doctors have been beaten up. You know, it's big pharma. It's big, you know, it's the big healthcare companies that have the CEOs making 24 million bucks a year. You know, I mean, these guys, they've got the whole system, you know, it's insurance guys. They've got the whole system rigged. So, but sound money will fix this. And that's why gold and silver, you know, and Bitcoin are, are as important as they are in terms of bringing sound money. Um, you know, it's the money. I mean, my Twitter handle is fix the money, fix the world. And I, I really, yeah, I really believe it. I mean, I, I think it's, it's sad that more people don't fully understand it. But I think if you, if you had to point to one cause of a lot of the social and, and economic difficulties we're, we're facing, I think it's that we've got a broken monetary system. You know, you know what would be a cool, Kev or Larry? The government, if they really love us, instead of yeah. giving people a monetary stimulus check, they should each buy, each family buy, everybody gets five ounces of gold paid by the government. Then do your reset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's right. Just do that. Yeah. Give us gold. Don't give us fiat. Give us everybody. Yeah. Give us five, six ounces of gold, the whole planet and gold yeah. and silver coin, yeah. and then do your yeah. reset. At least everybody, 
you're you're you would be, be preserving fair. something. Yeah, it would it would definitely it would definitely be fair. I mean, there I you think, go, Patrick. You just you just solved the entire monetary problems of the world there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's going to be t- <laughs> it, it's it's going to be tough, but you know, it we. Here's the thing, guys. It will be better. This is not a forever problem. It really is not. I mean, you you know, this has happened before in history many, many times. And when it does happen, it, it's tumultuous. Don't get me wrong. It's going to be going through. It, it's not going to be easy for some people and for a lot of people. But it doesn't mean it doesn't last that long. And when you reset to a sound money system, they do repair themselves. I mean. You know, they, it's it's amazing. I mean, people work hard. They get up and every day. People get up, and go to work, and try and make the world a better place. And you know, they're going to keep on doing that. The problem is, right now, we're just dealing with this this funny money, and it's like it's like trying to build a house with a, a yardstick that keeps moving and changing. I mean, you can't figure out how to do it. You know, it's just too complicated, and it screws you. You know, so so anyway, that's 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 yeah. my input for today <laughs> thanks larry uh, larry i'm running, uh, running out of stuff and i'm getting redundant so no so we, I love we, hearing we you. wrap it up <laughs> yeah it was great yeah. we did everything we did charts we talked fundamentals we talked uh, the solution yeah. for the world we, we covered everything today yeah whatever feel free to cut out any piece you like if you don't mind when you do get it done um if you could send me a link to it and i'll put it out on my twitter feed so people oh, can nice. see it. that'd be great yeah and you'll get some followers and all that stuff i mean you guys charts are fabulous i mean i really the way you the way you built that one chart on the fly as we were talking, that was really cool. And isn't that a powerful chart, right? Yeah. I mean, showing how cheap miners are. Yeah, I mean, it is, yeah. I mean to me, it puts, it puts that, everything in perspective. Yeah, that's that's my lead chart when I'm trying to get people to invest in the miners. I'm like, guys, you, you don't need to put all your money here. It's just like, why don't you put five percent of your money here? Because can't you see the thing's going to go up three hundred percent? And then, and then in two years' time, people will be looking back at the chart and thinking, why the hell didn't I see it? Well, you know, that's right. Get, well, it, well even worse, hopeless. they'll be in, they'll come in and they'll chase it, and then when it doesn't repeat itself, they'll yeah. say, "You told me to buy this shit." And I'm like, yeah. you know, it's 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 so. I mean, it, it, it's human nature. People just they, they chase performance, and that, that that's particular okay. chart. What you got to figure out is what inning you're in. If you're in inning three, and you're like right, like right now, we've had two good years, so you know you can still you could chase that performance, right? You know, in a couple more years, we'll have had five or six good years, and what maybe an eight or a nine year event, you could maybe chase that performance. In year eight or nine, yeah, you know, it's not going to be so obvious, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that particular chart that Patrick drew, he drew a, a line on it, and when it breaks beyond that line, that's the that's the real starting point of the the trend. He put out. I noticed you put an alert on it, Patrick. And when it break yeah. does break through that line, the um the, the miners really are going to fly, and that's why oh, we yeah. take the chart. And yeah. It's like a, a technical chart enables you to to mark the starting yeah. point. Yes, yes, like, yes. And I, and I you know remember the marijuana stocks, or remember the dot com stocks, ura- or, uranium, or the Fang stocks. I, I honestly think there's going to come a time. It's probably three or four years from now. I mean, maybe your charts might inform you a different date. There's going to come a time when gold stocks are going to look like that. Everyone's going to say, "Oh, what gold stock you got? What'd you buy? What'd you, you know, oh, I made a killing on this. Oh, I made a killing on that." And by the way, when that's going on, I'm going to be going bye bye. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sold to you. you know, yeah, maybe I won't. I mean, I, you know, who knows? I mean, it depends where we are in the cycle. But the point is. It, it's not going to be so obvious then, no. you know, it, right now to me, it's really obvious, but you know, to most people, it feels very difficult because they look at the history and they go, this hasn't worked. Why should I do that? You yeah. know? Yeah. yeah. The thing is once you've lived through those cycles once or twice, you can, well, um, that's the thing. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm 64. I've seen a bunch of these. I mean, this is to me, this is like, Oh yeah, I know what this means. You know, and I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure. But I, I, mean, I feel pretty good about it. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I, you know, I've got. If you say how much of, you know, I, I've got more or less. I mean, I've got some other assets. But I got more or less most of my assets in this bet. And you know, I at sixty four. I wouldn't be doing that if I didn't think that, uh, you know, that it was a pretty sound bet. So. Yeah. All right. So. Great, Larry. Okay. Thanks, uh, guys. Really appreciate us- it. Yeah. Yeah, do, uh, do you want to give some, uh, just like your Twitter handle or your website again? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um, it would be great if, if, if at some point if you could put up my website or just mention it because you can yeah. sign up for the newsletter. Their newsletters are on there. They're posted there. So my uh, my website is EMA2, Edward Mark Alpha, the number two dot com. Um, so, yes, exactly. EMA2.com. Perfect. Yeah. So 
Uh, right, there you go. And you'll see there's a, uh, you can download a fact sheet. You can, uh, you can look at our quarterly letters. If you scroll down a little bit, there's a place you can sign up for those quarterly letters. If you hit that, yep, I won't spam you. We just send out a letter every quarter. Uh, right, um, right. So feel free to do that. Um, and, um, but you're all passionate. I am a robot. <laughs> Oh, it didn't work? No? Oh. Yeah, I'm saying, yeah, no, he, he just had to say he wasn't a robot. And I'm oh, yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you are a robot. Yeah, well, he's a charting robot. When he's, when he's doing those charts, he's a robot. He's a, he is a robot. He did that really quickly. It's a nice job. Well, yeah. gonna, I'm going to post it on Twitter, and I hope you're going to retweet it, Lawrence. Oh, definitely. Uh, no doubt. That's kind of silly how many followers I've got. There must be a lot of, a lot of gold uh, bugs. You're, you're, oh, the you're gold, yeah, good sign. The gold bug community is growing, which is good. We need that to happen, so. All right, guys, thank you very much. I got to run. You probably do too, but I really I enjoyed it. And as, you know, I'll be happy to come back and do more in the future. It's, uh, it was nice the way you were able to do those charts on the fly. It's kind of fun stuff. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. Honored to okay, meet you. Guys. Thank you very much. We'll see you. Bye-bye.